How many is here for the first time? First timers in the house. Can't lie in church. Cannot lie in church. I see you. I see you. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Um, home coffee is one of the greatest coffee sup spots in San Diego. Have a coffee. Meet me over there. We'll, we'll, we'll get Albert to buy you one. Uh, Albert Mindeville. How do you spell it? Instagram. A, uh, okay. Proverbs chapter 30. Did you get an outline today? I'm going to give you the answers up front because I'm probably not going to preach the outline. Okay, so number one on your outline is dishonor. Number two is barrenness. This is for all my type A people. Number three is discontentment. And number four is gossip. What did he say again? So all my type A people there for your outline. All my type D people, D people, A, D, D people. Let us go into the word. Amen. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 11 through 16. There is a generation that curses its father and it does not bless its mother. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. The leech has two daughters. She doesn't just have two daughters. She has four, but it starts off by describing the two daughters. The leech has two daughters that say, give, give. Anybody know leeches? There are three things that are never satisfied and fourth, never say enough. The grave, in further description, it says, the grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. Today, I want to talk to you from the subject, becoming a life giver, becoming a life giver. God, we just thank you for your presence, your spirit, for bringing all your children home. Speak to them, to minister to their hearts, to touch their lives, to give them clarity and direction, and just love on them minister well to them like you always do. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, don't let them watch football on the phone during the sermon. You can be seated today. Some of you may not know this, um, but I was in my earlier years going down the, the route of being in the medical field. And so I was an intern in a medical trauma unit in the ER, and it was my first day with my white scrub jacket. And I walked into the ER, and there is a lady there, who was about 47, 48 years old, and she was coming in uh, through the doors, and they were uh, performing uh, CPR on her, and she had flatlined, and they'd been working on her for several minutes they were up to, I think, about 40 minutes. And then the doctor starts having this discussion with everybody else who is following the procedures by they're looking to him. Are we going to call it? Are we going to be done? And the doctor does something. He says, let's, let's give the interns a shot. So if the doctors let the interns work on you, you are in trouble at that point. That was his way of saying, we're about done, but let's let them have this experience of resuscitation. So I get up there and I start doing the CPR on this lady. And like what every good Christian does, we start praying, God, in the name of Jesus, life, we speak life over this lady. I hope your physician is a Jesus name praying. <sighs> Make, if you talk to your doctor, be like, hey, are you an atheist or a Christian? I just need to know in case of an emergency and get a doctor that's a believer because you're going to need some prayer too. Amen. So I'm pumping on her, her chest and I'm saying, Jesus, heal her, raise her to life. All, all, the, all the things that uh, faith is, is saying in that moment. And uh, she comes and she, she get, gets her heart rate and goes to the intensive care unit and then moves floor to floor. And throughout the weeks, uh, I would walk through the floors and I would see her and she would be eating and talking and I'd be like, good morning. And she's like, hello. Why does this guy keep saying hello to me in the weirdest way possible? 
It's because I saw you dead, and now I see you alive. I was your breath. I was your heartbeat when your heart wasn't working. That's what we're called to do as believers. We're called to be life givers. And people that walk in here today, some of you, your heart is shattered and it's not beating, but we're like, we're going to keep praying and pushing and working that thing. And you feel like you've got the air knocked out of you. We have the Holy Spirit and encouragement for you today. We are life givers in this house. And maybe you don't feel very alive in this moment, but I'm happy to be a life giver. The Bible says... That the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that God comes that we might have life and that much more abundantly. Jesus is not the author of confusion. He's the author of life. He's the finisher of our faith. He's come to give us life. He breathed into the dirt so that man, dirty old man, would become a living soul. That we might experience life. But if God is a life giver... I also want you to know there are things that block life or try to steal life from us as we live and journey on. The text talked about a generation who is without honor, who is greedy and self-righteous. It talked specifically about their teeth. The way it defines their teeth was like they were like swords. And then there was another set of teeth that were like knives. And what it was describing was a leech. A leech has two sets of teeth, like a knife and like a sword. But here's the interesting thing about a leech. A leech has in its saliva a sedative that numbs the skin. And so when it gets on you, it numbs your skin before it bites you so you don't feel the effects of the bite because you're too numb to feel it. So you don't realize you have a leech on you until you start to feel lightheaded and dizzy and you look down and see some creature that is attached to you. This is how life works. Some of us just walk around and we're like, I'm just tired and I don't know why. I'm just weary. I'm just going through this season like, I don't know what's happening. I'm just crying right now. Like you're, what? I, I can't put my finger on it. I don't know why I feel weak. Nothing seems the same. I, we've lost our spark in our relationship. And I used to come to God and I used to just worship and I was so excited, but now I just can't wait for service to be over. I, I used to love to read my Bible, but now it just looks like a bunch of names I can't pronounce. Because there is an enemy. There are many enemies to life. There are leeches that attach itself to you so that it might steal, kill, and destroy the life that God has come to give to you. And some of us are too numb to know we've been bitten by the thing that is draining us. And so I want to tell you for a second, and I might only get through one point, uh, so you'll have to come back next week. But I want to tell you one of the things that drains us from life is dishonor. It said in Proverbs 30, 11, there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. Ephesians 6, 2 through 3 said, honor your father and mother. All the parents just shout it right now which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long life on the earth. Because whatever I honor, I bring life to. And whatever I dishonor, I create death in. And a lot of people don't know that you can actually have honor and boundaries at the same time. So you dishonor what you're offended by or hurt by to keep yourself safe, but it is never safe to be dishonorable. And so we live in a life that is dishonorable, but whatever we dishonor dies. Why is my relationship dying? I don't know. Is there dishonor in your relationship? Why is my worship dying? I don't know. Are you really honoring God with your heart? Because whatever we dishonor dies. There's a great scripture in Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 says this, when he had come to his own country, 
He taught them there in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is it not, is it not his mother called Mary, his brothers, James, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. He did a few miracles. He's like, anybody got a headache here? You got a headache? Let's, let's do that. We can't do the major miracles because miracles don't flow in places of dishonor. But if I were to tell you today, be honorable, you all, we all have versions of what that looks like. But before we talk about honor, let me talk about a more significant word that I see in this text is that the Bible said when they saw him, Joseph's kid, the carpenter, don't we know his little brat brothers and sisters? This guy, and all of a sudden he says, they were deeply offended by him. You cannot be offended and honorable in the same place at the same time. You cannot operate in honor and operate in offense at the same time. So then I ask, how do we operate in honor? And then we start performing honor rather than honor being a deep place of healing in our most offended place. And today, it's gonna be a weird question and we can just get home coffee afterwards to make it all smooth over. But are you offended with Jesus? No, <laughs> I'm here, aren't I? When you said, raise your hand for the envelope, did not my hand go up? They were in the synagogue. <laughs> they were hearing messages and sermons. They were going over scripture. And they're like, who is this Jesus? Who is this guy? Isn't he just this guy? Let me give you one other off, off the outline text. John, he goes into prison. King Herod puts him in prison. In Luke chapter seven, it says this. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in his audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. When Jesus hears about John going into prison, the Bible said that Jesus withdrew. The next thing he does is he goes to Galilee, then he goes to Capernaum. I don't know if you've ever looked at the, the maps in the back or anything like that, and the, the old leather, it's called the Bible. Most of you use phones now, but there's maps. There's maps in these books called the Bible. And Capernaum is actually a beach. Let me get this straight. Jesus, here's about John going to prison. And Jesus goes in the opposite direction to the beach. How mad would you be if your partner in the hardest time of your life says, going to Mission Beach today. It's going to catch some waves. She goes to the beach. I love this part. And there was a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him, who was sick and ready to die. And they go through this big conversation and, and, and they says, you know, the Jews said, look at this man. He, he, he's, he's been good. He, he paid his tithes to the synagogue. He's, and they said, he deserves to be healed. He, he deserves to be healed. He, yeah, he deserves. And Jesus goes and heals him. Hold on. I'm John the Baptist. I'm your cousin. Familia. Mi gente. My Pete, you're my cut. I baptized you, Jesus. But this guy over here, you don't even know him. And you're going to heal him. 
And he goes on and he goes on and there's this widow lady and he goes and does another miracle. And the Bible says he had compassion on this lady and his heart broke. Your heart broke for her, but I'm stuck in prison. And the Bible, oh, Jesus, he just messes with us sometimes. He, John's messengers are in this whole story. <laughs> and the messengers go back and say, John, guess what? We're having revival, man. <laughs> like so many good things are happening right now. Can you believe what happened? The centurion, he had faith like no other in the Bible. It was amazing. And his son got healed. And there's this woman and Jesus is like weeping and said, I'm going to save you too. Everybody gets a car. You get a car. You get a car. Everybody gets a car today. And John's like, what? I'm your cousin. I'm, the, I'm preparing a way before you. In the, the, you. We talked about this. And you're over here doing all these miracles for other people, but where are you for me? Yeah, sure, I, I want to celebrate that you got over COVID, but not everybody got over COVID. And so one person's testimony is actually another person's problem. So you're like praying, God, I need a job, Lord. Lord, give me a job. And somebody who doesn't even serve God, they got three jobs. They're giving away jobs. God, I'm tired of being lonely. Send me a mate. You know what the scripture says. It's not good for man to be alone. <laughs> Make it up. Bible verses to fit your, your, your context. <laughs> God, you, you see her. Use me, Lord. It's a willing servant. It's not good. <laughs> Somebody else, they're not even praying. They, and they just got married to a Pinterest wedding person. And their dad paid for the wedding and everything. You're like, God, what about me? You hear these songs of God's faithfulness. God could do miracles. God could do this. God could heal cancer. And you're like, but I got cancer. God, God, God's going, God's going, by this time tomorrow, God's going to turn it around. Turn around. Everyone's, yes, yes. Come on, let's record a video. God turned it around and I was going through this and you're like, but God, what about me? And the messengers go there and they're, they're like, John, it is so good at the beach right now. Like Jesus is really doing some good work. If I was John, I'm just adding to the text a little bit, but if I'm John, I'm thinking like, Jesus, get rid of Judas and come pick me up right now. And let's go change the world. What are you doing with you? You don't even know them. There's an amazing scripture that says, when Jesus, when John's messengers left Jesus, Jesus then begins to talk about John. And the disciples of John showed him all the things. And John calling into two of them disciples, sent them to Jesus saying, is it you? Or should we look for another? Have you ever felt that way with Jesus? Like, I know they said, like, you're the guy. But me and you ain't working right now. Should I look for another? Should I, should I just go back to drinking? Should I just, like, I felt more blessed in the world than I do in the church. Is it you, or should I just be looking for somebody else? The messengers walk away, and Jesus says, you know what? John is the greatest of all men. The, the He's the greatest that has ever been in mankind is this man named John. But the messengers didn't stick around long enough to hear Jesus say good things about John. So all John could read into and hear is the good things that are happening for them and the bad things that is happening to him. 
But Jesus has this other perspective. And the perspective is, oh, John is the greatest. Cousin John is so amazing. He's the the best born um, among all men. Anyone who was ever born in this world, John literally is the best thing that's happening. John, we're fulfilling the mission. John, we're doing what we're supposed to do. But it's not measured by your circumstance. It's not measured by the prison you're in. It's not measured by the miracles I'm doing in others' lives. It's simply us having a plan and knowing that no matter what happens in your life, I love you deeply and I love you dearly. And the enemy has come to short circuit the story of God over your life. And we've looked to other people and we've measured what's happening in their life and it's keep up with the Joneses and it's keep up with the Jesus miracles and it's keep up with everything that we can keep up with, but we can't keep up anymore. And so all of a sudden we realize, maybe you haven't heard it in a while, that what is happening to you is not God's disapproval for you. And what is happening to you is not God's punishment toward you. But God has a story called the gospel that is for you that says, man, I love them. I love, they, they stay faithful. I don't even have to worry about John because, because I think so highly of him. I got a special place for him. I prepared a place for him. I love John. What do you do when you have all of these things happening in life? but you feel lifeless and you walk in dishonor. Is it that maybe the measurements that you have set out for God have caused you to be offended with God? I'm not offended with God. I'm, you know, you could be preaching and be offended with God. You know, you, you could have sang all the songs this morning, loud, proud, and clear and there be hidden offense in your heart. And you know where offense shows up? In how you honor or dishonor other people in your life. Offense shows up because the great command is love God, love people. And so what does sin do? It doesn't let us love God well because it keeps us offended with him. And it doesn't let us love other people well because it keeps us offended with them. But your problem is not with people. Your problem is with God. If somebody talks bad about me, I'll just keep it to me. If someone talks bad about me, let me tell you something. I don't care. No, like, you're like, you don't care about them? No, I care. I just don't care. Why why don't you care? Because people that want to believe good about you will never believe bad about you. And people that want to believe bad about you, no matter what you say, they will never believe good about you. It is not my job to convince people of who I am. It is not my job to convince people of my righteousness, but just to love people, to walk in honor. Oh, did you hear what they said about you? And... (laughs) there's no retaliation in my heart I wasn't the most popular candidate to take over the church it's hard to believe hard to believe (laughs) not everybody was happy about that very hard to believe but there is no ill will in my heart because it's not about me it's about the kingdom of God This is about the kingdom of God. Nothing to, nothing to, a lot to improve, nothing to prove. A lot to improve, nothing to prove. Dishonor is like, man, I didn't even realize that I'm walking with a wound, that my life is actually being drained by this leech called dishonor. They didn't honor their fathers and mothers. Let me tell a secret. It's one secret. Don't get mad. I prayed for President Trump. I couldn't say it last year because we're in council culture and y'all would have counseled me. 
And I pray for President Biden. Because that's what we do. We honor. We honor. I pray for my children's good school teacher and for the bad one. The bad one actually needs more prayer. <laughs> Some of y'all, don't pray. What? <laughs> they need it. <laughs> talk. I'm trying to ruin people and talk bad about people. and That's an offense in my heart towards God, not towards people. What do you do when you're offended with Jesus? Like, am I offended with Jesus? What do you do when you're offended with Jesus? What would Jesus' advice be when your child dies? When you've been so faithful and you lose a job. When you've been so, fa- when you've just done all that you could do, when you've done the best you could do and you keep experiencing turmoil in your life. You're like, where are you, God? What is your problem, Jesus? It's a great scripture. In Matthew it says, 11, 6, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus is like, don't get offended with me. You don't understand. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. There's a lot of questions. We're in search of answers and control, and we're in search of how to get things right, how to be right, how to take these four points and apply them to our life. But maybe it starts with God healing offense in your heart that you didn't even know existed. The fruit of your offense is dishonor. And in this house, it has been my wife and I's job to take every seed of dishonor and get it out of the ground. Like, oh, is that dishonor? No, we pulling that out. Because we want to restore honor in this house. We want to restore honor in this house. So the Lord said, I want you to sow seeds of honor. And I want you to teach husbands to honor their wives. And wives, honor your husbands. Honor authority. Oh, God. (laughs) This culture, man, is crazy. I'm a part of it. It's crazy. This generation. Honor authority. The scripture says, honor church leadership so you don't make them cry and everything. It's like the message version. Honor, even the dishonorable. Be a David and don't cut Saul's robe. Don't don't cut, don't stab him in the back when you know you could take somebody out who's been dishonorable to you. Love them, bless them that curse them. Pray for them that despitefully use you. They ask you to go a mile, go another mile. If they ask for one cheek, let them smack you in the other cheek. God is your defender. God is your justifier. So we walk in the power of being healed. And when you walk in honor, what you're saying is, I'm accepting and receiving the full healing of God in my life. You know what is is good? Is you should take debt of everybody that owes you emotionally, spiritually, physically, and say, Jesus paid for it. Oh no. That's hard to do if you don't believe it. Hey, forgive us this day, our debtors. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Because to the ability that I can forgive my debtors is the revelation that I am receiving of how much God has forgiven me. So I walk in an honorable life because I have a healed heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask first that you would show us the area of our offense towards you, where bitterness may be, where strife may be, where gossip may be. Some of us here today, we call it processing. Where anger and malice 
and discontentment and always jumping to the next thing and always being critical of others and everything. And if I was in charge and if I, and if they only saw my gift, all of those areas of offense, God, I pray that first you reveal to that individual, that individual alone. And then I pray right now that you begin to heal. You have crowned us with honor and glory. Your sons and daughters, you have crowned with honor and glory. So we don't have to justify our life. We don't have to fight for our own rights. We don't have to fight with everyone and everything that you've assigned to us, but we can love people back to life. We have received life today so we can become life givers. So we can be the heartbeat for those who have flat lines. So we can be the breath when those around us have got the air knocked out of them. So we can be prayer warriors for those who are disgruntled in their soul and we continue to see the goodness of God at work in their life. So we can see reconciliation, so we can see restoration. Healing in the name of Jesus. The bomb of Gilead, the oil that has the power to heal every offended heart. Your marriage counseling doesn't work if you don't let the spirit heal your heart. Because your brain can never take you out of the place of a wounded heart. Your brain cannot lead your life into wholeness. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't stumble on account of me. Maybe you've seen your situations and you've reflected. Don't stumble on account of me. So God, I don't say this sacrilegiously, but any of offense that I've had towards you as the God who's in control, as the God who's sovereign, as the God who oversees all, any father wound I have for wrong perception I've had of you, God, I release that and receive your forgiveness. I receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Would you stand to your feet? With every eye closed and head bowed. Today you might feel a little drained. Today in your mind you might be toiling a bit. Today you have, may have been reflective on, man, I, I am a little angry. I am a little going through some stuff still work anybody still going through some stuff y'all ain't going through stuff oh yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm still as long as i'm breathing i'm still going through some stuff and, and the healing of god is not just an event it's along the journey and and, and the wounds that you need healed today you need them healed today because you can get some new ones tomorrow so we can't have wounds on top of wounds. That's like a lot of dysfunction. So the wounds for today, God's like, I want to heal you. Don't, don't stumble on account of me. Every eye closed. Today, if you say, if you know that scripture in John that says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and you felt drained in your heart, drained in your life. But you know the second part, that he came to give life and life more abundantly. And you want that life in Christ. I want to say a prayer with you. Would you just raise your hand so I can see who I'm praying with? God bless you all. God bless you all. Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. No repeated prayer works. Only a repentant one does. But let me help you with some language. After we pray this prayer, I want you to begin to thank God. I want you to open your heart. I want you to talk to Jesus like he's the Lord of your life and Savior of your life. But would you repeat after me, Jesus? Forgive me of my sin. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Today is the day of salvation. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your righteousness. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. Give me life and life more abundantly. Rebuke the works of the enemy 
In Jesus' name we pray.